Welcome to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting, Homecoming 2017, featuring inspired messages from your 3ABN family, all to prepare your heart for the coming of the Lord. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. No, first and foremost, I want to welcome all of you to 3ABN's Fall Camp Meeting. And have not we not had some of the most beautiful weather? And the anointing of the Lord is in this house. And so, and for all of you that are watching, are listening on 3ABN Radio, watching, you know, the... The, one of the most amazing things that I have discovered about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Hal and I have traveled a, a good deal. And when we were in India on Sabbath morning looking at this, uh, the Sabbath school lesson, it was the same quarterly and the same lessons that we were studying here. When we were in Russia, Pastor Bradshaw, it was the same thing. So all of you from around the world, just get your Sabbath school quarterly. We are going to have an incredible Sabbath school today. Haven't you enjoyed the book of Galatians? And you know, it's been exciting and learned so much. And then next quarter, we're looking at the book of Romans. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Before we start our Sabbath school, I would like to introduce the panelists. First, we have to my left, Brian Hamilton. Brian, it's so good to have you here. Good to be here. And John Dinsey. Good to it's, have you here. It's a great blessing to be here. And Jill Morricone. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to open up God's Word and share it together. And everybody knows our Pastor John Bradshaw. Pastor Bradshaw, so good to have you here. Thanks, Molly. Good to be here. Happy Sabbath. Well, happy Sabbath to you. Um, before we go into the lesson, I would like for us to open in prayer. Now, we've prayed. I would almost say that every one of you have already prayed this morning. But I'm going to ask John Dinsey, if he will, please, to open in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that today you have blessed us with the breath of life. We thank you that we can come before you in Jesus' name. And we pray that you will bless us as we study together. We ask for your Holy Spirit to give us the words to speak. And we pray that in all things your name may be glorified and your children edified here and around the world. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you have your quarterly, turn to the 14th lesson. And also, you with your Bibles, turn to Galatians. And we're going to start in the 6th chapter. Now, our memory text is Galatians 6.14. And something that is our custom is that we all read our memory text together. So will you join with us, please? It's Galatians 6.14. Let's read that together. But far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You know, before we start into uh, Sunday's portion of the lesson, I wanted to just kind of give us a little foundation of why Paul wrote this letter to the book, or, or wrote this letter, which is uh, what we know as the book of Galatians. Now, remember, Paul is the apostle to whom? To the Gentiles. Now, Paul had been to a province, an area known as Galatia. And so he had established, it doesn't say how many churches he had established in this area. We know at least probably two or three and possibly more. And Paul was an apostle. Now here's what an apostle does. An apostle builds, establishes, and then leaves. Now what Paul had done was he had built, he had established, he had appointed as his custom was. He would appoint elders or leadership in those churches and then he would be about the Lord's business. He would go to established churches in other areas of the world. So now in the church there at Galatia, something started happening. There were men that were coming to, and they were teaching heresy. They are called Judaizers. Now, knowing Paul's temperament, do you think this set well with him? 
it upset Paul to no end that these men were coming in and teaching heresy. Now, here's what they were teaching. They were teaching that these Gentile believers couldn't be members of the church. They couldn't obtain salvation unless on top of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they were circumcised. They were adding to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ a portion of the law, the law of being circumcised. Now, this upset Paul to no end. And so Paul, remember, this was a long time ago. And so the way Paul had to deal with this, the only way he could deal with this, he couldn't just hop a plane and fly to Galatia and get these things straightened out. What did he have to do? He had to write a letter. And thank goodness was Paul a prolific letter writer. Now, I, I kind of likened this to Danny Shelton. Now, he, I use him as an example quite often. But did Danny build and establish Three Angels Broadcasting Network with the understanding that we would present a message that would counteract the counter myth, the undiluted Three Angels messages. That is what this ministry was built and established to proclaim. So let's just say that Danny has to go somewhere else in this world and do other work for the kingdom of God. And he turns 3ABN on, and what does he see? Somebody teaching heresy. Now, do you think that's going to sit well with Danny? Now, what's Danny going to do? He's going to hop a plane. <laughs> Paul couldn't hop the plane, so he wrote this letter. And, and he wrote a book, though. <laughs> yeah, did, did, Paul, Paul wrote letters. Danny does write books. He's written some incredible books, as a matter of fact. So Paul viewed this heresy as an attack on the very essence of the gospel itself. Because what these Judaizers were saying, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ plus something. Now, what does it take to become a child of the living God? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What Christ brought out for us at Calvary and nothing else. Paul was incensed and he knew he had to respond. So he wrote the letter. Now these writings of Paul, were they effective? They are so powerful and effective that even the great reformer, who is the great reformer, Pastor Bradshaw? Well, there were many, but the great, great reformer would be Martin Luther. Martin Luther. What was he reading when he came to the realization or the understanding of justification by faith? What books? Well, in particular, he was reading Romans, and he was also reading Galatians. Mm -hmm. So Luther was reading Romans when, he, when that verse leapt off the page at him. That came back to him as he was walking on his knees up Pilate's staircase, the just shall live by faith. So Luther was uh, a, a New Testament man. And uh, his time spent in the, in the gospel, you know, imagine life without Luther, where we'd be today. Someone's going to say there was another Luther, but imagine the church today without that contribution. We'd be in an altogether different place. Yes. And the message of righteousness by faith, it's very important to the Seventh-day Adventist church, is it not? That's and a foundation. It's very, it's foundational. And it, because of Martin Luther grasping this great truth, the whole world has, has changed. It'll, it'll never be the same. And we thank the Lord for that. And we thank the Lord for this letter. And I just wanted to give you a little foundation as to why Paul was writing this letter. Now, the portion of the scripture that they are allowing me to address today is Sunday's portion, and it's Paul's own hand. So I want you to, again, we're in Galatians chapter uh, 6. And we're looking at Paul's own hand. Paul would dictate a letter to a scribe. The scribe would actually write the letter, but something that Paul did was at the closing of the letter, he would always write a portion of the letter from himself. So Galatians 6, 11 says, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own what? 
with my own hand. So, you know, in looking at this, evidently he had written it large, and because we haven't seen it personally with our eyes, or, or he didn't go on to explain that, you wonder why exactly he was writing it in large letters. But how many of you text? Or, or even do emails. When you put something in caps, what does that mean? You want people to pay attention. It's kind of like yelling on the, with the typewriter. So, you, so the, I'm going to say that for Paul to say, look what large letters I am using here, it was because he was saying, pay attention. I want you to look at this. Now, Paul wrote 13 of the books of the New Testament. How many books are in the New Testament? 27. So, I mean, he was a prolific writer. So, in the, uh, in the books of the New Testament, his closing remarks in these 13 books aren't always the same, but they're usually quite similar. However, in his closing remarks in the book of Galatians, there are two significant differences, and I wanted to go over those differences. The first significant difference is... In the other letters, he's very personable. His closing remarks address specific individuals. However, in the book of Galatians, he's polite but formal. Now think about this. When you're polite but formal, that's not a lot of warmth going on, is it? So you ask yourself, why would Paul be polite but formal? The fact that those converts that he had labored so diligently with were turning, the way he words it, is to a different gospel. Now that, he, again, Paul, Paul was a little, um, he could be a little feisty, could he not? And so he was seeing that these people he had labored so diligently with were turning to another gospel. So go to Galatians, the first chapter. Turn in your Bible to Galatians, the first chapter. Let's look at verses 6 through 8. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. Paul says... I marvel that you, now he's talking to these believers there at Galatia, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a, what does he, how, what does he call that? A different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be, what's that word? Let him be accursed. Well, now, I love the Amplified Bible. I study out of that. There's, there was a time when I only quoted the King James, but I started studying the Amplified Bible, so guess what started happening? I started trying to quote the King James, and it, I would get... King amplified in there. You just, what, whatever you're saying, what you behold, you become. So what I was studying, that's what I started quoting. So the word accursed, here is the definition out of the Amplified Bible. The word accursed, let him be accursed, anathema, devoted to destruction, doomed to eternal punishment. So what is Paul pronouncing on these Judaizers that are coming to try to uh, give another gospel or this heresy to these men and women there in the churches at Galatia that he has labored so diligently over? He is saying anathema, doomed to eternal punishment. Anath anathema means a ban or curse solemnly pronounced by ecclesiastes authority and accompanied by excommunication and you know in this time if you were excommunicated what that spoke to you was you had no hope of heaven so Paul is serious about these men that were coming and teaching this heresy not only does Paul say that anathema let him be accursed in verse 8 he repeats it then in verse 9 
Paul's strong sense of justice is coming through loud and clear. The word and the word only. Is that what Paul was saying? The word and the word only? That would be sola scriptura. How many of you hold with that? Sola scriptura. The word and the word only. It doesn't matter what your traditions teach, nor what your experience may have been. Sola scriptura. Correct doctrine is all that matters. Correct doctrine always takes precedence. Paul cares about these deceived believers. Were the, were the believers in Galatia listening to this deception? Some of them were falling into this deception. He cares about these believers. He does all he knows to do to get their attention. Now, the second thing that's different in this letter, his final words are usually just closing remarks. In this letter, he continued beseeching these believers in Galatia to turn from their foolish ways. And he says... He was doing it again with those large letters. He wanted these wayward Galatians to return to correct doctrine and lay aside their heresies. Even in the very closing of the letter, he once again addresses the issue that is so strongly on his heart. Look at verse 15. He says, for in Christ neither what? What is that word? In Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but a new creation. The word and the word only. It doesn't matter. Let me say this again. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter what our traditions teach us. It doesn't matter what we may have experienced. If it's contradicting the word of God, it's not the truth. The word is the truth. Anything that contradicts the word of the living God is a lie. And the lie in light of the truth of God's word will fall to the ground. How often? Every time in light of the word, sola scriptura, this word and the word only. Pastor Hamilton. Okay. Well, uh, I have Mondays. And Monday's uh, study along with Tuesdays, was on the subject of boasting. Boasting in two different things, though. Uh, boasting in the flesh versus boasting in the cross. And I believe Brother Denzi's got the boasting in the cross. You've got the better one. <laughs> <laughs> I have the boasting in the flesh subject. There were two different motives we'll find out as we study these two days. The boasting in the flesh motive was a selfish motive. The boasting in the cross was a motive of love. Two different motives, two different subjects of boasting. So let's look at the text for um, Monday, and that's found in Galatians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. And by the way, this is, this is the part of the book of Galatians where Paul is wrapping things up. And his normal practice in his letter as he wraps things up is to be a bit warm and fuzzy. You know, tell sister so-and-so, you know, tell her hi or give her my love or I'm thinking of brother so-and-so. And, you know, he, he ends his letters with, um, with warm fuzzies, you would say, with expressions of love. But Galatians, he started out hard-hitting and he doesn't end lightly either. <laughs> and so there isn't the warm fuzzies here that you would normally see in his letters. So Galatians chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13. But as many desire to make a good showing in the flesh. Did you hear that? A good showing. That ought to talk a little bit about motive here. These would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Another interesting little phrase there, may not suffer persecution. Verse 13, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, 
but they desire to have you circumcised that you may boast, that they may boast in your flesh. Okay, so that's the text. Uh, Paul gives us uh, some hints even before this on the very same subject of motivation. These teachers that have come in, what are their motivation? What's in their heart? Why are they doing what they're doing? And so if you turn to um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 17, there's another uh, little hint as to their motivation. In fact, it's pretty glaring. They zealously court you before no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, uh, that you that you may be zealous for them. Now, I'm going to do something I don't normally do, and then I'm going to read this out of a version called the Message Bible, okay? I don't study with this one. It's a bit freewheeling, but it's very expressive. Those heretical teachers go to great lengths to flatter you, but their motives are rotten. <laughs> they want to shut you out of the free world of God's grace so that you will always depend on them for approval and direction, making them feel important. See, now uh, back, back to Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh. So the motive that's coming out here is somehow to gain approval. If they court you and they get you into their court and compel you to be circumcised, their motive for doing it isn't that they're winning you to the Lord. Their motive is that they can boast. They can gain approval of men or even maybe God by what they're doing. You see, this, it, the motive is, is uh, a bit twisted there. I'm, I'm intrigued by this. And only that they may not suffer persecution of the cross of Christ. That puts, takes me back to uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 11. Uh, I think that's the verse I'm looking for. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. So some of the motivation for the pushing of the circumcision was a motivation of not wanting to suffer. See, Paul suffered by presenting the cross of Jesus. That was not a popular subject to address, the cross of Christ. That brought persecution, both from the Romans as well as from his fellow Jews. And these people were trying to be Christian, stay Jewish, and not suffer any kind of persecution as a result of it. And so that was part of the motivation is to, you know, if, if, you, were, uh, if you were a convert to Judaism, one of the main signs of it for males was circumcision. And the Romans didn't always treat people um, justly, but they let the Jewish people practice their faith. And if you could prove that you were Jewish, you were safe. And so this was a safety issue, you might say. And, uh, and so that was another motiv motivation. Verse 13, uh, 13, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Uh, it was kind of like having a trophy. Now, you folks maybe don't, have this temptation quite like some of us who are pastors or church leaders. But there's a great temptation for us to climb the ladder of success in spiritual things by our trophies, the number. Oh, I just baptized 500 here last week, you know, <laughs> something like that. Now, praise the Lord, the 500 were baptized, right? But is my motive for the baptizing selfish for praise of men? Or is my motive for baptizing that souls are saved in the kingdom and praise God for what he has done 
not what I have done, you see. But they were boasting in what they were doing. Uh, how am I coming on time? Am I still okay? Still okay. okay, all right. Now, so, so what, what had brought us to this point? How come these maybe uh, outward appearing, well-meaning Jewish Christians coming into Galatia, what was the, the whole history of the background of that? You have to go back a little ways. Uh, you think of from the time of Moses up to the time of Jeremiah, the big temptation for the God's people was the worship of graven images. They kept falling back into that. You know, right? Moses was up getting the Ten Commandments, and what were they doing down below? Worshiping graven image. So when they were taken by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon, they were cured forever of the worship of graven images. As I thought about that whole subject, too, I, I, it wasn't the theology that was attractive to them. It was the worship practice that they were enamored with. Think about that. In the Christian world today, are we being enamored by the worship practices of secularism, entertainment industry, and is that creeping into the church in its worship practices today? That's almost like worshiping a graven image, you see. But they were cured of that. When they came back from, from Babylon, uh, they set up synagogues all throughout the land. And they assigned teachers, scribes, and, and priests to teach. Not only reading, writing, arithmetic, that type of subject, but they also taught the word of God, the law. They were very zealous for the law. And, uh, and that was good. But Satan always takes the good and tries to pervert it. And this happened again. They began to lose sight of the, of the purpose of the ceremonies and the rituals and, and the practice uh, at the temple. They begin to lose sight of its meaning and actually begin to look to the services and the temple and the priests as the ticket for salvation. Instead of what they all meant in, in the Messiah that would come, they, they, they gloried in the services, they gloried in the temple, they gloried in the priesthood, and not in the Savior, not in the Messiah. And so as they lost their spiritualness, formalism crept in. They added laws upon laws to help us sort of keep God's law, man-made traditions. And Jesus had something to say about that. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, this is Matthew chapter 7, verse 5 to 9, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders and eat bread with unwashed hands? Not hygiene issues, let me tell you. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. So that's what the, the Jewish faith had deteriorated into as you come into the time of Jesus. It was formalism. It was ritual without meaning. And so now here uh, these Jewish people become Christians. They accept the Messiah, but they have all this baggage of formalism. And I find it interesting, God wiped all that out in the New Testament era. The only ritual we have is foot washing, the Lord's Supper, and baptism. All the rest wiped away because he knew our tendency to worship the service and not the Savior, you see? So that's kind of the background that was leading to why these men were where they were at, doing what they were doing, and why Paul was resisting it vehemently, vigorously. <laughs> so anyway, if we're to boast, let's boast in the cross. Let's boast in the Savior and not anything about what we do. Now, I have two things that I've, I took as a, as a um, lesson for us today. As we go out to present the gospel, it's important that our message is spot on. You see, their message was not on. They were off on their message. But not only that we have a right message, we have a correct motive. 
that's what I took from the lesson on Monday. Very good. Pastor Dinsey. I am blessed to talk about Galatians chapter 6, 14. I think at first I started looking at it and I said, well, there's really not much here. But as you dig, you began to see wonderful things in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Now, I like to read this from the King James Version, and then we'll go to the New King James Version, so you can see a little difference in the translation. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now, when you go to the New King James, you see these words. Well, it says, but... God forbid that I should boast. Here comes the word boast instead of the word glory. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. But we read from the lesson something similar to this. This is from the revised version. But far be it from me to glory. And there's so to boast. There's the word boast. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom? through which the world has been crucified unto me and I unto the world. And when you see the words, but God forbid, the two Greek words here are interesting because in the King James they use the word God forbid. It's really a strong declaration because the word theos, which means God, is not really in the Greek. It is two words that are trying to express strong a declaration to say something like, be it far from me. Oh, may it never be that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I'm not going to boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is something marvelous to consider. Uh, when you consider the Jewish mind to them, it was offensive to think that the one that they expect to be the Messiah was crucified on a tree or a cross. To them, it was a horrible thing because uh, you read in Galatians, uh, earlier in Galatians, and in it's Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, they were very happy that Christ was crucified on a cross because uh, it was a message to the believers in Christ. This man is cursed. In other words, there is no possible hope for the person hung on a cross. They are lost. No way to redeem them from that. So they were trying to discourage the followers from continuing, continuing to follow Jesus. So cursed be anyone that is hung on a tree. Uh, so, but Paul is saying, boast in the cross? Now, what was it to the Roman mind? The Roman mind thought that dying on a cross was such a, a horrendous, horrible thing that a Roman citizen was of such dignity that even though he committed horrible, heinous crimes, they would not put him to death on a cross. This was reserved for those that were not Romans. So it was a horrible, horrible way to die. I don't know if you've ever looked into dying on a cross, but it was a horrible, horrible death, a slow, torturing death that would normally take days. And you're hung on a cross. Imagine that you're somewhere hot. You've been somewhere hot, Pastor John Bradshaw. Uh, and there are insects coming at you, and you can't do anything about it. Your, your hands are nailed to a cross. You can't do anything. So it was a horrible, horrible way to die. And as you slowly began to die, you imagine the animals become interested in your death because that means a meal is coming. So it was a horrible, horrible way to die. And so, uh, but Paul says, God forbid, or far be it from me that I should boast 
Let's talk about boasting for a moment. I don't know if anyone here has ever boasted. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, people talk about things they are happy about and they rejoice about, or they, you know, there's a verse that says something similar to, pride cometh before destruction and a great fall. Be a haughty spirit before a great fall. I remember when I was much younger, way back in the horizon before, and the horizon was the falling of hair, <laughs> and uh, my hair was black. Now I'll think way back, not too way back, because I'm not that old. <laughs> but there I was a teenager, and we were doing some exercise, some exercises in this place, and um, uh, we were lifting our leg uh, in some way, and I said, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I'm doing really good at this. And I was looking at the others and said, boy, I'm doing better than they are. And some people taking a tour came in, and for some reason, they said, I'm doing good. They're going to see me. And I started doing it a little fancy, and my foot slipped, the one that was on the ground. Yeah. And there I went, blap, yeah. on, the, on the floor. Now, what do you think happened to me at that moment? <laughs> I was not as happy as before. I was not as rejoicing as before. My boasting became an embarrassment. So uh, for us as Christians, boasting should not be a part of our experience, either by words or by actions, because um, people lose sight of Christ. And we remember the scripture that says, uh, let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And so this is what we should do. Our words and our actions should glorify our Father, which is in heaven. Now I'd like to go to this part about the cross. Oh, the cross. And what, would, what was really Paul talking about here? Was he just talking about the cross itself, the instrument upon which Christ was crucified? No, he's talking about... Christ dying on the cross, the atoning sacrifice of Christ, which means salvation unto everyone that believes. Because the Bible says that God so loved the world. So when you think of Paul saying that I should boast, but in the cross, you have to think that he's talking about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for his sins, for my sins for your sins. And so when we think of the cross, we see, uh, think of Jesus dying at the cross, we see a God that loves us so much, so great is this love, that he's willing to give his son to rescue us from condemnation of sin and from the wages of sin, which is death. Christ took our place. We should have been on that cross. We deserved to be on the cross. But Christ took our place. So that's why Paul is able to say, I can boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is something to really boast about. And now we can tell the world about Jesus. There's a song that says, take the world and give me Jesus. Take the world and give me Jesus. The early Christians really didn't look for attention to themselves. They looked to bring people, people's eyes, people's thoughts to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Because the Bible says that there is salvation in no other name but Jesus. And they knew that. There's no salvation in the sacrificing of animals. There's no salvation in any other name under heaven. And now there are some people that name certain names, and I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to go into that because we have very little time. But the only name by which we can be saved is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because if you take out uh, from history the fact that Christ died on the cross to save us, you might as well uh, blot out the sun, take the sun out of the sky. Because, and then the, there will be no light to shine upon this earth. This earth will be complete darkness. And this earth still has light and grace because Jesus died on the cross for us. And that's why you and I have hope today. That's why you and I 
can say, um, Lord, forgive me for my sins. By looking to the cross, the Father looks. When, when a sinner comes to the Lord, the Lord looks at the sinner, but looks at uh, Jesus dying on the cross for the sinner, and we can be accepted, as the Bible says, in the beloved. And that's why the worst, the worst, the very worst, if you consider yourself the worst, there's hope as you look to Jesus. And I would say to you that... Uh, it is far better for us to look to Jesus than to ourselves. By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So this is a decision every one of us has to make. We talked about the flesh. Some people boast in the flesh and their accomplishments. But uh, Paul is saying, when he says that the world is crucified to me, he's talking about the flesh, the desires that this flesh may have for the world. And that's why I go back to, you take the world, but give me Jesus. And I want to encourage you to continue looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we uh, need to remember Luke chapter 9, verse 23. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 9, verse 23? Jesus said, if any man will come after me, if anyone wants to follow me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. And this is what we all need to do every day. Take the cross to crucify self and follow Jesus. And as we follow Jesus, the closer we come to Jesus, the closer we realize that he died to save us, the closer we examine this subject of Jesus dying on the cross for us, the more we will lose sight of self and our accomplishments and our great things. The more we talk about Jesus, the better it is for us. And I would say to you that the more you talk about Jesus, the more the holy angels draw near and you will have an atmosphere of heaven wherever you go, yeah. wherever you go. I would like to finish with this scripture that we should know. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. By grace... Are we saved? And that, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And I would like to add the next verse, just the first part. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Let our boasting be about Jesus. Let our glorying be about Jesus. And let, uh, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, let, if anyone wants to glory, let him glory in the fact that God is saying that he knows me and understands me. So I want to encourage you to look to Jesus and lose sight of self. Look to Jesus and find hope and salvation. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Denzi. What a blessing. Hasn't this study in the book of Galatians been an incredible blessing? I know it has ministered to my heart and in my own walk with Jesus. I think I have, Pastor Bradshaw, the best day of everybody here, and that is not boasting. Uh, I have a new creation. To me, this is the most incredible topic. The gospel is all about change. The gospel is about God taking us from the depths of of sin and despair, the slime and the pit and the mire of that, and pulling us out, cleaning us up, justifying us, standing us before the Father in right relationship with God, and transforming our lives, making us into the image of Jesus. I have one verse here for Wednesday, a new creation, that's Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. It comes right after what Pastor Johnny shared. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. You know what's incredible to me? Because... Paul in the book of Galatians, and we have talked about this on the panel, and the entire quarter has been about this. He has really dwelt on this subject of circumcision. And we could say as New Testament Christians, well, why is he getting hung up on circumcision? But you know what? Within the Seventh-day Adventist church, we have some pockets. We have some things that could be caught up in the same thing, believing that I am justified by faith, but I have to add some works. Instead of 
understanding that we are justified by faith, by grace through faith alone. And nothing I do or don't do can ever merit or earn any salvation. And so the message in the book of Galatians is not just for the Galatian church. The Judaizers came in and taught them that. It's for you and it's for me. This passage in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Paul talks about it three different times. There's three parallel passages where he mentions circumcision and uncircumcision do not avail anything. And we want to take a look at that, and then we want to look at how we can become a new creation. So the first passage is one chapter back. We're in Galatians 5, verse 6. Turn back just one page to Galatians 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. You see that parallelism. It's the same thing we just read in chapter 6, verse 15. But this is different. It says, but faith working through love. It reminds me, Brother Johnny, what you just read, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace we are saved through faith. Let's jump down to verse 13. Because some people say, Paul's gospel is all about freedom in Christ because we're talking about justification and he doesn't focus on any of those works aspect. Let's look at verse 13. You brethren have been called to liberty only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. He's bringing some balance here. But through love serve one another. In the Greek, there's a word added that's not here in our English translation, and it's the word the. It says through the love, indicating God's divine love, serve one another. The word for serve in the Greek is a word that would come from doulos, meaning slave. Through love, through God's love, we're not called when we're, we're freed, we're justified. Paul says you're walking in freedom. We're not called to stand in freedom and to do whatever we want. We're called to have God's divine love in our hearts and then in turn serve other people. Serve our brothers and sisters. It's the essence of the gospel is self-sacrificing love. From the manger to the cross, Jesus, his whole life, he lived to bless other people. And his, his whole life was about self-sacrifice. You think about sin. It originated in heaven with Satan, with self-seeking. But the character of God is the exact opposite. Self-sacrificing love. The second one, we look at the first parallel in Christ Jesus. This is Galatians 5, 6. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. The second one was the passage we actually had for today. That's Galatians 6, 15. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Now that word for new in the Greek means new, fresh, of a new kind, unprecedented dented, unheard of. You know, have you ever met someone and all of a sudden you say, you haven't seen them in a long time. And then you come back and you see them again and you think, something different about you. There's something different. You used to do this. You used to act this way. You used to have this dark countenance. And all of a sudden, I see Jesus. I see a transformed character. When God gets a hold of you, you know what happens? He changes you completely. We don't even look like the same person we used to look like. We are changed completely. Those old habits, those old addictions, that old way of thinking, the old man of sin is put to death and the new person comes out. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The same word for new there, completely new, unprecedented, unheard of. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now let's look at the third parallel passage. We're going to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. 
circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. The wording's a little different, but it's the same principle. He's saying the circumcision or the uncircumcision is not the point here. But what is? It says, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Now, Miss Molly, when I first look at that, I think, okay, keeping the commandments of God, Paul is bringing in a different concept. He has been saying, what matters? Faith working through love, serving other people, self-sacrificing love, a new creation. And now all of a sudden he says, I'm talking about the law, keeping the commandments. Let's take a look, uh, Galatians 5, jump back to Galatians, Galatians 5 verse 14. We read verse 13 just a few moments ago. Let's look at verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think of 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. The Ten Commandments are a transcript or a picture of God's character and God is love. So when Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, is nothing but keeping the commandments what is he saying we are to represent the character of God and God is love all three of these passages have the same import and the same meaning now let's look in our remaining time at how are we to be transformed you might be at home today and you might be saying you know what I don't even want to be changed I like where I am right now. And you know, Pastor Johnny, I've done that. I remember once getting in a discussion with my husband. It was a discussion. And I was thinking, you know what? I really don't want to change. I know I'm in the right and things are, you know, he needs to change. And I kind of wanted to wallow in that. I don't know if you ladies have ever, ever wallowed in something like that. I wanted to wallow in that. Like, okay, I know I should be changing. I know I should become a new creation, but I kind of like sitting where I am right now. Sometimes we don't have the desire for a new creation or for a change. And sometimes we have the desire, but we have no power. God, I'm in addiction. God, I'm enslaved in sin. God, I can't change. I want to, but I can't. There is hope for you today. Philippians 2, 13, one of my favorite scriptures. It is God, not me, not Pastor John or Pastor Johnny or Pastor Brian or Molly or any of you. It is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The word in Greek for will is desire. So if I don't even have the desire to change, if I'm wallowing in my funk, what happens? God says, I can give you the desire, Jill, to ask for forgiveness, to get out of what you were in. If uh, uh, That's the first word. It is God who works in us to will, that is desire, and to do. Do in the Greek is power. God knows we don't have the strength to change ourselves. We come to him. He gives us the power. So how do you and I become a new creation? I think three things. Number one, ask. Number two, accept. Number three, allow. Ask. Ask for his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for him to enter your life. Revelation 3.20, behold, he says, I stand at the door, I'm knocking. If anyone will open the door, I will come in. Why don't you open up your heart to Jesus? He's not going to force. He never forces. Love does not force. But he says, open up the door and I will come in. First step to becoming a new creation is to ask for his forgiveness and ask for him to enter your life. Number two, accept his gift of salvation by faith. Accept it. It is a free gift. Grace means we get what we don't deserve. He takes our penalty. He takes our sin and he gives in exchange for that eternal life, his righteous white robe. Number three, allow him to change you. Surrender to his control. 
Allow him to do that work in you. Let him transform you. One of my favorite scriptures, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Hold on to that word. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word transformed in the Greek is metamorphosed. God wants to change us from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Real quick, Greg and I were, he loves nature. And one morning he said, Jilly, come look outside. And there was a caterpillar attached underneath the porch railing, our front porch, and he was spinning his cocoon. And every day we went out and we peeked, he's still there. We peeked, still there, on Sabbath. There has to be a lesson with that. On Sabbath, Greg said, Jilly, hurry and come outside. And I looked outside and the butterfly was coming out. That exemplifies the transforming grace of God. What he does in your life and in mine. How he changes us. We wallow on the ground like a caterpillar. We crawl in the dirt and the mire of sin. And he by the power of his spirit changes us. And we come out as a butterfly by beholding him. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are transformed, the same word, metamorphosed, are changed. We're changed by beholding Jesus. We're changed by the washing of the water of the word. We're changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know about you all today and you at home, I want to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I'll have the closing prayer now. <laughs> Would you say man out there? Yeah. All right, Galatians 6. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Verses 16 through 18. This is, the, this is the, the, the final stanza here. Paul has written almost six chapters to the people in Galatia, and then he says, And as many as walk according to this rule. Do you understand what he's saying now? Verse before that, In Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but the butterfly. <laughs> and as many as walk according to this rule, Notice what Paul is doing here. He's pretty uncompromising in this letter to the Galatians. As many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them. In other words, if you don't walk according to this rule, no peace on you and mercy and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Then he signs off, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirits. And he writes, Amen. I'd like to review with you where we've been this quarter in the book of Galatians. I can't review in depth. This is just grazing across the surface, but I'm hoping it will bring us down to our final three verses here at the end of the book of Galatians. Paul begins and he says, I marvel. I'm just amazed. I'm astonished that you've left the gospel that I gave you and you've embraced something else, which quite frankly, isn't even a gospel. This is very straight language. Paul is, is determined to help them see the seriousness of their situation. They have stepped off the platform. See, here's what I maintain. I maintain that when you step off the platform of the truth of God's word, you've just stepped into quicksand. And there's no telling how far you're going to sink or how far you're going to drift. But you are going to sink and you are going to drift. There's only safety in the Word of God. See, there are some people who figure that they're smarter than God. The first evangelistic series I ever held, I cannot tell you where it was, because you might figure some things out. If you know where it was, then you're home and hose. First evangelistic series, and I was preaching about the 2300 days, very enthusiastically. And a man of some great experience came to me and he said, I used to believe that. He was a church member, I used to believe that. And I, I, I looked, you know, I was 
I was still a little green, wasn't used to men of experience telling me they used to believe the truth. He said, I used to believe the truth, but then I said, I don't believe that anymore. I studied and I've learned some different things. I said, man, you have to be intelligent. You must be smart. And he, he first, <laughs> first, he took it as a compliment. <laughs> he said, well, I am a doctor, you know, and, and uh, you know, I said, no, no, really. Ellen White believed this. James White believed this. J.N. Loughborough believed this. John Nevins Andrews believed this. Uriah Smith believed this. The General Conference President believes this. Evidently, you know more than they do. You must be smart. <laughs> you know, he stopped and reflected on that, and then I think he figured out what I was getting at, and I figured out it was time for me to get out of there. <laughs> uh, When you decide that you know more than the church, you better be right. You're not. You are wrong. But when you know more than the Bible commentary and the Biblical Research Institute and the church, no, I don't want to sound like those folks where I came from and said, well, we have the magisterium and we dare not think otherwise. But my goodness, think of the hubris it takes to decide that you know more than the church that you know more than what's been revealed to us in the spirit of prophecy, that you know more than the collective wisdom of everybody in your congregation. Here were some people who knew more than the rest of the church, and for reasons that seemed good to them, they decided they would step off the platform, and Paul said, I marvel, I'm astonished. He spoke, as was spoken earlier, let these people be anathema, who don't believe the true gospel. And then he talked about his own credentials as an apostle. He said, I received these revelations. I didn't confer with anybody. I got what I got directly from God. You understand the pressure he's putting on them here. What I got, I got from God. Where did you get what you got? And what do you have that can possibly be better than this revelation that I received directly from the Almighty? So Paul kind of lays into them right from the start. It's not until chapter 2 that he gets to the, the point of circumcision. And he starts to say, or he says in Galatians chapter 2, I received the gospel of uncircumcision. That's a really strong term. This gospel message that I have, the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's the gospel of uncircumcision. So what do you have? It cannot be the truth. It cannot be right. He talks about the time in verse 11, he withstood Peter to the face because Peter was an error, you know. And I want to look with you in uh, chapter 2, starting from verse 16. Let's look there. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. He's talking about circumcision as the works of the law. You're not justified that way. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the what? Faith. By the faith of Christ and, and what's that next word? And not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Paul is really clear here. You think this is a, to a talk about... Uh, talk about circumcision. It's not. It's about justification. Wait, it's about salvation. Let's take it a step further. It's about the gospel. Paul's saying the gospel is at stake here. And it mattered to him. This was Luther before 1517. This was Luther before the castle church. This was Luther long before uh, uh, the 95 Theses. Luther was defending the gospel. He wasn't attacking a church. He was defending the gospel. He knew, ah, you could let the church teach whatever it wants to teach, but he, they would, the church would be robbing people of the gospel, and we cannot let that happen. So Luther stood up and said, the people must know the truth of the gospel. And Paul was doing the same thing in Galatians. You've got to know the truth of the gospel. He goes on and he says in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I... But what? Christ. Christ liveth in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In contradistinction to people who are living essentially by the works of the, the law, the works of the flesh, whether it's circumcision or anything else. Paul nails this. I am crucified with Christ. So is he talking about circumcision? He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about justification. He's talking about grace. For he goes on and says, this is how desperate your situation is, Galatians. I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead. How? In vain. What you're doing is negating the death of Jesus Christ when you say that righteousness must come by a work, a work of the law, a work of the flesh. Again, and Jill spoke to this eloquently when she said, all right, we may not be hung up on this issue, but boy, Christians today have their own issues. You know, it's right to eat right. It's right to dress right. It's right to tithe right. It's right to worship right. But you are not saved by any of those things. Once you are, you become a foolish Galatian. Dress as right as you can. Modesty is important. The world's forgotten that, but a uniform doesn't get you through the gates. Eat as well and as, and as healthily as you can. That's good for you. That's good for you. But the road to hell is paved with uh, uh, egg substitutes and, and fake meats. <laughs> it's right to eat right. But the minute you think you're better than anybody else, you're closer to God, or you've somehow earned favor with God, man, that blessing's turned into a curse. You got the right day. Well, congratulations. The people who nailed Jesus to the cross had the right day. Amen. But if that right day is being carried about by a person who's still mean and hateful and angry and bitter and critical and unconverted, that right day is going to come back and bite you in the judgment. God's going to say, you had all this light. What did it do for you? You didn't allow it to sanctify you because the truth is something that ought to sanctify us. Now, I, I don't know, but I think the clock here at 3 ABN is faulty. Uh, <laughs> It goes extraordinarily fast. So let me hasten on a pace. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, how do you get the Spirit? How did you get it? And he talks about Abraham. Oh, he's appealing now to the father. Of that father, Abraham. He's appealing to, you know, if anybody knew anything about circumcision, it was Abraham. And he goes back and he says, Abraham was made righteous by faith. He said, if you've put on, if you've been baptized then you've put on Christ, he says later on in chapter 3. He says, there's no more Jew nor Greek, uh, bond nor free, male nor female. You've got to be careful how you toss that verse around. Of course, distinctions still apply, but in Jesus, you're one. There's no advantage in terms of salvation being one or the other, the other or the one. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And in Romans chapter 4, he says, sorry, Romans, Galatians chapter 4, verse 9, he says, you've gone back to the weak and beggarly elements. Man, oh, man. He couldn't have made this any stronger if he could have. You all have enslaved yourselves. Why are you going back to these things that are worthless? Justification comes from God. What is grace anyway? We are not saved by the works of the law. And the, Galatian, uh, the Galatians weren't just saying, you know, we prefer to do this. If you were to confer with your doctor when your baby boy is born and say, we, we just think this is right for our family. No harm done. That's okay. No harm done. Paul wasn't saying this is something that a Jew or a Gentile should never, ever do. He's simply saying that now that you all have elevated this to the status of justification and righteousness and right standing with God, ah, uh, we have a problem then. Then that's not right. He appeals to them, have I become your enemy? Knowing that by the time he gets to Galatians 4 and verse 16, he probably is their enemy now. <laughs> In Galatians 5 and verse 1, he appeals, stand Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and don't become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Listen, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you repent of your sin, you call on him to fill your heart with his presence. That's salvation. And you may say, but I'm not the finished product. Look around you. <laughs> I'm not the finished product. That's why we grow in grace. We grow in grace. We grow in grace towards the kingdom of heaven. Certainly we're not the finished product. And if you ever look in the mirror and say, huh, 
I think I'm the finished product. <laughs> and you are deceived and you are deluded. And now what you've said is, thank you, Jesus, for getting me this far, but I've got it from here. I'm the finished product. Let me run to the finish line. I can do this now. Thanks so much for your help. Oh, we need Jesus desperately, desperately. And Paul was saying justification comes by grace, by grace. Don't frustrate the, the grace of God. Through faith, faith in Jesus, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. He talks about that beautiful salvation experience that Philippians 2 and verse 13 uh, elaborates on, where Jill quoted uh, that beautiful, most powerful verse of Scripture. He says to these people, Christ has become of no effect to you. Can you imagine that? Of no effect to you. So we'll look at these last three verses. Paul says in verse 18 of chapter 6 and not chapter 3, verse 18, sorry, verse 16, as many of them as walk according to this rule, peace be on them. That's the rule. He's, he's clear about that. He says, <laughs> I like this. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. I don't want to be bothered about this anymore. <laughs> I don't know if this is frustration coming through. I don't know. It sounds a little bit like it. I wouldn't charge him with that. I would say this is just straight talk. Let's not go over this ground anymore. Let's not bother with this anymore. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know, the lesson asks a really interesting question. Uh, the lesson says... Essentially, what has following Christ cost you? You know, you could be living in a place where you've lost your family to be in the church. You could be living in a place where you lost your job, lost your life. There are some countries where people escape across the border. They're baptized and they go back and they don't tell anybody what they've done. Because if they did, they'd be executed. Well, what did Paul say in Romans chapter 8? Just powerful. Romans chapter 8. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, verse 18, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I want to say this just very briefly. For us, we're not, we're not suffering for Christ. You know, in India, where they drag you out of your home and, and maybe burn you in some, some villages. Or in Iran, where they'll take you and stone you. In Egypt, where they'll destroy your business and run you out of town. Yeah, that's suffering. But for us, you know, you lost a job. Look at you. you you're well fed. You're okay. There's someone who's in a snit with you. You know, that's okay. Paul was stoned. The marks that he wrote about in Galatians chapter 6, he was stoned. He was beaten. He was whipped. And he was able to say, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen. Paul said, they're really not much. He said, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up freely for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things and then go on? And read late in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's powerful. Paul's message was clear. Paul's message was a message we ought to take on board. Paul's message, God's message to us today in the context of this lesson is Christ. Thank you, Ms. Molly. Amen and amen. And you know, our prayer for each one, you know, in... Um uh, Galatians 6 1, Paul says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, our prayer for each one of you and each one of us is that God will oh, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Isn't that where everyone is saying things can be hidden is in our hearts? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any evil way in us and lead us in the path everlasting. Would you like for that to be the prayer over your life today? You know, we are about to take a 15 minute break break. First, I want to thank all of you. You did an incredible job. But we will be back here in the 3ABN Worship Center in 15 minutes, and um, we're going to have Little Richard with us. So in the meantime, you that are viewing or listening to 3ABN on media, we have Tim Parton that's going to be playing some beautiful music. So we don't want you to go anywhere. We'll be back again. I believe it's going to be two minutes, and or pardon 
pardon me, 17 minutes and nine seconds. We will be right back. In the meantime, God bless you. We love you. Thank you.